Hello everyone. I am sorry that we're not having church today, this Easter Sunday, but I did want to share with you my sermon for this particular Easter Sunday. Uh, we're going to be talking about why I believe from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 30. Before I start, though, I have a few things I want to say. Uh, first, I want to say a big thank you to both of my daughters, Sonia and Hannah, who are assisting me with this recording. Without their help, this would be very, very difficult. So a special thank you to them. The other thing you see is our Good Friday uh, event. This was uh, uh, something we did on Good Friday. All the little pieces of paper that you see on this cross are actually uh, pictures of a Roman curse. And I was talking about how Jesus became a curse for us. And so we signed our names across these curses and nailed them to the cross in symbol that Jesus Christ became the curse for each of us and provides for us salvation. One of the most interesting accounts of the resurrection of Jesus is that of Thomas. We are told that on the evening of the resurrection in John's account, that the disciples were gathered together, undoubtedly to discuss the amazing reports of Jesus' resurrection. The women had come to them from the tomb and told them, Jesus is not there, and an angel appeared to us and told us that Jesus was alive. And then Peter came back and reported that he had been to the tomb, and indeed, there was no body there. It was empty. Luke confirms this account. Both accounts indicate that the room where they met was locked because they were fearful of the Jewish authorities. John tells us that Thomas, for some reason, was not there with them. Eight days later, they were once again gathered together when Jesus appeared in their midst. He intentionally challenged Thomas with his physical resurrection. Let's take a look at that in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So things I want you to notice from this passage of Scripture is the concept that this takes place eight days later. Jesus was crucified on a Friday, and he arose on a Sunday. During the week that followed that was part of what was known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during that feast time, most people that had come to Jerusalem considered that a Sabbath type of an event. So they would stay in Jerusalem, and that would explain why his disciples were still in Jerusalem eight days later, even though he had 
told them through the angels and through the women messengers that he would, he would go ahead of them into Galilee. So they were still in Jerusalem observing this feast assembly. But eight days later, things had changed. They were still locking the doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. They were still concerned about the things that had happened and were happening around them. There were people that were questioning the resurrection even in their time frame. And that is important for us to understand because the high priest knew the tomb was empty. They had basically bribed the guards to say to everyone that Jesus' body had been stolen by his disciples, as Matthew tells us. And there were other people who were commenting probably, well, they just got the wrong grave. And there were other people that probably said, oh, it's just somebody that looks like Jesus. And so those things were probably floating in the culture and the moment that they were living. And so that is part of what we need to understand. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the dividing point between Christianity and all other faiths. And it is no surprise that it is the one thing that is most often attacked in the Christian faith. Because it is the very validation of the statements of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, nothing else that Jesus said means anything more than another wise man or another good teacher said. Why I believe. The progressive Christian movement developed out of the emergent church movement in the 1990s. In 2006, the Phoenix Affirmations were written by a group of emergent church leaders, and it formed the basis of the, the modern progressive Christian movement. There are eight points to progressive Christianity. One is that they believe that the following the path and teachings of Jesus can lead to an awareness and experience of the sacred and the oneness and unity of all life. The second one is that they affirm that the teachings of Jesus provide one but many ways to experience the sacredness and the oneness of life, and that we may draw from diverse sources of wisdom in our spiritual journey. The third pr principle that they, uh, they believe in is that they seek community that includes all people, including but not limited to conventional Christians and questioning skeptics, believers and agnostics, women and men, those of all sexual orientations and gender identities, those of all classes and abilities. The fourth thing they believe together is that they know that the way that we behave towards one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. The fifth point is that they find grace in the search of understanding and believe there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. The sixth thing that they uh, propose is that we strive for peace and justice among all people. The seventh thing is that we strive to protect and restore the integrity of our earth. The eighth and final point is a commitment to the path of lifelong learning compassion, and selfless love. In John, 1 John chapter 4, John writes these words, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The most important point about progressive Christianity is 
cultural relative, uh, relevancy. All Christian teaching is subject to the individual search for truth as it relates to personal well-being and moral action. Salvation is based on conforming our actions to the intentions of Jesus or Christ's teachings. They don't use Jesus, they use Christ's teachings. Many promote the idea of developing within ourselves the Christ consciousness. Doctrine, scripture, and absolute truth are subservient to my discovery and journey of faith. Morality is determined by social action through social justice, environmentalism, on and on and on. And that is the structure of most progressive Christianity. What is interesting to me is that many people that proclaim themselves as progressive Christians will deny the resurrection. There are a few that hold to it, but they believe it to be an unimportant doctrine that does not legitimize anything. It's just an interesting coincidence. When you drop that concept of that doctrine, it is destructive to the whole fabric of Christianity. This is based in their thinking on the concept of making more just and acceptable world. Its roots are in a concept that goes back to the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. It is from the progressive era and it's called the social gospel. Many liberal Christians of this era who supported the social gospel went on to support an evolutionary view of society. It developed into an elitism that would lead in one branch to eugenics. When cultural elitism determines ethics without a moral anchor, you end up in terrible places. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, who he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most The progressive Christian movement traces its impetus back to Reverend Harry Emerson Fosdick. He was an ordained Baptist minister in 1903 in New York City. In 1911, he joined Union Theological Seminary faculty, and in 1918 became pastor of the prestigious First Presbyterian Church in New York City. He would serve until 1925 in that role. At the time, he was one of the best known ministers in the United States. He challenged during that time much of foundational Christian doctrine. 
Fosdick was personable and charismatic. People enjoyed listening to him as a speaker. He was often on the radio, often uh, invited to lecture, and very widely respected. He became a personal friend of J.D. Rockefeller, who, though a Baptist, was deeply antagonistic to the rising fundamentalist Christianity. And the Rockefeller family became one of his main supporters during his uh, ministry all the way up until his death. And they made him one of the most prominent Christian intellectuals of that period. His name was known all over, and he rejected such Christian doctrines that are fundamentalist as the virgin birth of Christ. He rejected most of the miracles of the Bible, if not all of them. He rejected every other major doctrine and questioned to some extent the legitimacy of the resurrection accounts of Jesus. For people in the progressive Christian movement, they would much rather move the resurrection to the concept of a spiritual event rather than a physical event. In John chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Basically, in John 17, Jesus tells his disciples that they must be in the world, but not of the world. There are three directions that we can take as human beings. Number one is in, but not of the world. Number two is in and of the world. Number three is not in, but of the world. By world, Jesus means the culture and social structure around the individual. Christians are called to live in the reality of this world without allowing its culture and ethical standards to dominate them in their lives. That's what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. For most people in our culture, and most cultures in the world, they live in the reality of their culture and they live with the reality of the social structure that they have to survive within. So they are, in, they are not only in the world, but they are of the world because they live with that social structure and it dominates their thought processes and dominates who they are and what they do. The third group are to be the most pitied because they are not affected by the realities of life. Instead, they are out of the world, but they are of the world. They are outside the realities that people live with in their lives, but they are of the world in the sense that the culture of this world determines everything. And the culture they live in determines everything, and realities never impinge upon their circumstances. One of the groups that is like this, who is in the world, who is not in the world, but of the world, are progressive Christians. They live a very unrealistic existence. Most progressive Christians are white, upper middle class, and are fairly well off. If you go to most uh, ethnic communities or to uh, people that are of different color, 
most of those people live in reality. They live with the reality of their neighborhood. They live with the poverty. They live with the crime. They live with broken homes. They live with all that stuff. But they don't have the, the pleasure of, of having leisure time to play with and play with ideas with. They live with the reality of life. Many of them go ahead with the culture because it's what's flowing around them and it's the only way to get ahead so you flow with the culture. If you were to go outside the United States, progressive Christianity has never gotten a foothold outside the United States and outside of Western countries. And the reason for it is most people live with the reality of life. They get up every day and try and make enough to feed themselves and feed their families and provide themselves with some safety and cushion. But for most progressive Christians, they have all kinds of leisure, all kinds of wealth, and all kinds of opportunity and very high standards of education. So they are insulated from the realities of life. But they are subservient to the culture. And that is the really dangerous part of progressive Christianity. This subservience to culture. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been, have been baptized into Christ Jesus and were baptized into his death? We were buried and therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. I really like this particular picture by Caravaggio. It is the incredulity of Thomas. It was painted in 1603. In the picture, you have the disciples, the three disciples crowded around Jesus. One of them is Thomas, and Jesus is pulling his hand in to stick his finger right in the wound in Jesus' side. You see the amazement that he has on his face, the the change, the, the strangeness of the moment. Thomas had been skeptical of the account of the previous gathering with the other disciples. Thomas had imprudently stated that unless he could place his fingers in the wounds in Jesus' hands and feel the wound in his side, he would not be convinced. Jesus on this occasion invites Thomas to satisfy his skepticism. Skepticism is a normal part of human nature. When confronted with exceptional events, Thomas's reaction was reasonable, if not a bit overstated. Undoubt, undoubtedly, if you were to go around Jerusalem on the day of the resurrection, there were all kinds of theories that were being bandied about in the community. Others in confusion undoubtedly promoted the idea that the location of the tomb had gotten confused. 
or others that the appearances of Jesus were probably accounted for by claiming his disciples were hallucinating, or they were creating a false account for their own gain, or an imposter was playing on the gullibility of the various disciples. These speculations only grew during the Feast of Unleavened Bread that followed the Passover event. It lasted until almost the next Sabbath. This would be explained, this would explain why the disciples were still in Jerusalem eight days later. In 1 Peter it says in verse in chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We know all of these explanations were promoted as alternative explanations in ancient times. Skepticism can always find a way to reconstruct facts and explain away the miraculous. They still find support in, in the progressive Christian movement, which would like to spiritualize or allegorize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Down through the centuries, the resurrection of Jesus has been the sticking point of faith. Jesus' claim to be God, his claim to forgive sins through his death, and his claim of authority as Lord are proven in the resurrection. That is why this doctrine is central. Ultimately, the struggle for progressive Christians really is the lordship of Jesus Christ. They would like him to be a stimulating, wise, idealistic teacher, not Lord. In a culture dominated by self-centeredness, Jesus being Lord demands that I think of Jesus as the authority rather than thinking of myself as the authority. When I do that, I have to take his demands and scripture's demands seriously. For Thomas, this question was answered by his inspection of Jesus' wounds. Doubt does not overcome the power of the resurrection in Jesus Christ. What I like about this entire incident in Thomas's life is this. Thomas fell down before Jesus and he said two very powerful things. He said, you are Lord, meaning you have the right to determine everything in my life. You are the one who has the right to all authority, and that includes my own opinions and ideas. And number two, he says, you are God. means that Jesus is the one who created the universe and he has a better understanding of the universe than I do. So I am not in a position to question his authority nor am I in a position to question his creation. 
And when I do that, I am arrogant to the utmost. That is why I believe. Thank you for listening. God's blessings on you. Hope to see you in church soon.